All right, so let's talk about Rust. Rust is probably a extremely powerful defense. It's been, for years, it's been the number one most desired language by coders. It came from Mozilla. And the point of Rust is to be as fast as C, but not as dangerous as C. And it really does accomplish that pretty well. So here's some Rust basics. You can run Rust on any Debian server. I have Debian 10 server when I did this before, and I just did it earlier today on this Debian 11 ARM server on my M1. And it's all working just fine. There's only uh, one pot where you have to change a few things, I'll mention. So you just install curl build essential and Rust C is the Rust compiler. And then you can make a Hello World app. So let me do that. Um, I think I put this one here. Okay, there's Hello World. Um, all right, there's the code. All right, whoa, whoa, that's the executable one. I wanted the, uh, the source code. There, all right, let's clear and put it up here so it's less. All right, that's the source code to print uh, hello, hello world, essentially. So you have a main, just like you would in C. For some reason, you start with fn. I guess everything is a function. You have curly braces, just like you would in C. And then you do print lang exclamation point instead of print f and then you can print literal text. So that will just print um, that, and you can run it with dot slash hello, and it says hello. So that just means you got your compiler working and uh, things are working. So um, let's go back here and int app. Um, the way I, I used a tutorial that I assumed you were making a project with um, multiple files. So instead of just putting everything in one file and compiling it, you make a directory for each app, which is the more modern way to do it. Um, all right. And so uh, let's, so this one here, uh, here's the source code. All right, so here's an integer. Now you, when you in Rust, when you define variables, you can take the default which I think is a 64-bit signed variable, or you can specify with a colon what type of variable it is. So this is an unsigned 32-bit variable. And that's why Rust is so valuable. You can specify exactly what it is, and then you can print them out. Now, if you run, if you compile this with Rust C, oops, I gotta spell it right, Rust C, It will not compile. It tells me you cannot use a unary operator minus to type U32. And that's the point. Up here, I made an unsigned variable, and I tried to set it to minus 5. You can't do that in Rust. This is the kind of thing you could do in C, as we're going to see. But this is why people love Rust. If you do something that doesn't make any sense, it will stop you and tell you and not let you do it. It will not just casually produce the wrong answer and keep going, which is what C does. So you can't do it. If you want this to run, you're going to have to make a different variable type that can handle a negative variable. And there's a tutorial that gives you the Rust variable type so you can see it and a flag defined that way. All right. And so now if I try adding numbers, here's another one that's going to give an error message. Um, all right, let's clear and cat add. All right, here, I let A equals 1, and then A equals A plus 1, the sort of thing you would do in many languages, including C. But you can't do this easier. Um, if I rush C add, then it will tell you the first assignment to A creates an immutable variable. If you don't tell it otherwise, it makes immutable variables. The same thing is true of Python 3. Python 3 can make immutable variables which means they're like constants. You can use them, but you cannot change that value later. If you want to make a mutable variable, you have to use mute A when you define it. Then it will be a mutable variable that you can change. So again, it's um, not particularly important exactly what variable types exist and exactly what code words are required. What's important is it warns you when you're doing something stupid and it tells you to fix it. So that what you write is what the code really does. The problem with C is you write things and the code actually does something very different, as we're going to see. So here's an integer overflow in C. Uh, so let's go here. 
Um, OVC is somewhere. Um, I'm afraid. I don't know where it is. Um, find dot minus name OVC dot C. All right, I'll just have to make it again. So I'll make it here. All right, so here's an integer overflow in C. Thought I made it before, but if so, I put it somewhere and I can't find it. So I define an unsigned character variable, which ought to contain an ASCII character, but then I set it equal to 230, which is not an, a, a valid ASCII character code. But the way C works, when you define a character variable, it defines a one byte variable, which is an unsigned byte that can go from 0 to 255, so you can put a 230 in there. It doesn't actually make any sense, but C will let you do it. Then you can find an integer of i. Now if I, for up to 10, I just keep adding to that variable and making it bigger. So let's compile this. I just use this code here. All right. So if I can, so we save that. If you compile that and then run it, it takes 231 and adds, and then when you go past 255, it just rolls over to the small numbers and adds from there. This is appalling. You have the coder. If you think about what happened here, this is why C creates all these problems. The coder defined something to be 230, and then they added to it, expecting it to get bigger, but it got smaller. And it doesn't create an error message. It doesn't crash. It just blithely gives you a blatantly wrong answer. It assumes that you know that a character is a integer variable that can only go up to 255. And I don't know how they expect you to know that, and that's why there are so many security problems with C, because it requires superhuman understanding of what C is doing to avoid falling into pitfalls like this. And you wouldn't have that happen if you used Rust. Let's see if I've got this here. Um, I do. All right. Here's the Rust version of that. Um, uh, All right, this is the same thing. I define an unsigned 8-bit character, 8-bit integer, mutable, to be 230. Now, this is what I did with C. C, remember, I called it a character, but it really was an unsigned 8-bit variable and mutable. So now I can add to it. So now I just make a loop and add to it. And what happens when I run it? It adds up to 251, and then it crashes and says you can't add any more. Um, and it tells you, so it does not ever give you the wrong answer. As long as it can add within the limitations of this variable, it does. And when you try to add another number and go above 255, it stops and tells you, no, you're trying to put something in there that won't go. It doesn't just roll over and give you a small number. All right. Well, I see a question in the chat about extra credit points. Um, if you go to these events, uh, every day you'll get 20 points to going to conferences like RSA. For each event separately, yeah. All right. Uh, so going to one talk is like 10 points, and going to a whole day of stuff is like 20 points. Anyway, anyway so uh, there's plenty of events to go to besides an RSA. Especially if you get to all four days, good. If you get in somehow with volunteering or something, four days of RSA is good for you. All right. So, uh, so there's the overflow, and then there's string overflows. So I should have this one too. Let's see if I've got it here. I do. There's my string overflow.c. So clear catch str.c. All right. So here's the string overflow, the same kind of thing we've been exploiting all along. I define two string variables. They're only five characters long with a's and b's in them. And there's it's five, not four, because you have to have a null byte at the end, which is implied but not explicit here. Okay, so there they are. And now I print the addresses of them and the contents. And now I want a new value for string two. So let's just run that. Okay, so string one is at F48, and string two is at F40, eight bytes before that. Now I'm going to put a new value for string two. So if I put in four C's, then string one remains the same, and string two changes to four C's. So in this case, it works out just fine. But if I run it again and I put in eight C's, then string two turns into eight C's, but string one is now empty because the null byte at the end of the eight C's overwrote the first byte of string one and made it fall to zero. And if I put in more than that, say 16, 
Now, string two contains the C's, and now string one contains a bunch of A's. This is the kind of thing that would drive you insane as a developer. I input data into string two. Why did string one change? How am I supposed to expect this to happen, understand this would happen, and prevent it from causing my program to do unexpected things? There is nothing in this source code that would make it easy for a developer to understand that reading data and putting it in string two is going to change string one. That is cruelty. And again, it would not happen in Rust. So if you do the same thing in Rust, that's stir app. All right. And so clear and catch. Here's the same program in Rust. You define a mutable string, which starts with these values. Then you just print out the addresses and the values. Then you read a new value for string one. Uh, just read in and go on. You're perfectly allowed to read a value without limiting length. So let's um, run this. All right, so string one is at C28. String two is at C40. So that is 16, 24 bytes further along. So I'll put a new value for string one. I put in a few C's, and in this case, it adds the C's to the A's, which is a little bit strange, but it's not terrible. Adds that to this, doesn't change this one. And even if I put in a really long value, let's put in 1, 2, 3, 4, whoops, whoops, I hit the wrong character. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Top 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. It works fine. It adds those 80 to string 1, and it doesn't change strings 2 at all. And notice something interesting. The addresses did not um, get further apart. Here, the string 1 is at 7E8. String 2 is at 800, which is, again, only 24 bytes further along. And yet I was able to add 80 characters to string 1 without hitting string 2. And the reason that happens is easy enough to see. I don't know if I'll bother doing it live, but you can use GDB and you can see how it works. And the point is Rust uses two layers of interaction. The actual string uh, addresses of the strings point to pointers. And the easiest way to see it is when you just print out the variable, print S1 and print S2. S1 is, in fact, stored at... Um, uh, I'm not sure I can see the actual address where it's stored, but the point is S1 doesn't move because it's just a pointer, and it points to another address. And if you put in a longer string, it will just change the value of the pointer here to point to a place where there's more room. So it will automatically move to a place with more room, so it will never be an overflow. No matter how long a string is, it will not leak into another string. And that's, that's the kind of thing why people love Rust. By the way, it doesn't solve every problem. Remember command injection, where you would actually create a command line like ping minus C1 followed by data that came from the user, and then you'd have a command injection vulnerability. Well, that's not really a problem with C. That's a logic problem where you use C to create a line of text, which you then hand off to another interpreter to interpret. So if you do that in Rust, which you can do, you have the same problem. If you actually build ping minus C1 followed by data that came from the user, and then run it in the operating system with Rust, then you're going to have the same problem. You can do the command injection and it will work. Um, so it doesn't solve every possible problem, but it solves a lot of problems. And there's another Rust project here where you do some fancier stuff. Um, you can look at a heap overflow and see how Rust handles it better than C. The heap variables don't leak into each other uh, the way they do in C. And you can see the storage strings are stored the same way they are with two layers of indirection, the same way they are for stack variables. And there's a dangling pointer project, too, where you allocate code and leave a pointer to it. And uh, again, Rust handles that because in C, when you allocate things, you then have to free them. And it's easy to either forget to free them, in which case you have a dangling pointer, or free them twice, in which case you write to memory that's not reserved anymore. In both cases, it can be fatal. In Rust, there is no free. You allocate something, and as soon as it passes out of scope, it automatically frees it, like when you leave that routine. So it automatically figures out where to free things. You never have to free it. So you cannot accidentally forget to free it or free it twice, which is, again, something that causes all these flaws in C. So Rust is full of these brilliant ways to improve the code so the things that go wrong in C will no longer go wrong. 
And that's why people love it, and that's why Linux and Microsoft are now building Rust into their operating system uh, to try to improve its security. So that's all I wanted to show you. I'm going to stop this recording.